Author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and today I am here at the Pacific Northwest Writers Conference in SeaTac, Washington, with Janet Wong, children's book author extraordinaire. Janet, welcome to Author. Thank you, Bill. So, Janet, if I wanted to, I could have an entire magazine devoted, no devoted to nothing but writers who are lawyers or have been lawyers, and you count yourself among them. But you're somewhat unusual in that you shifted to children's books. Right. from the law. So take me back to that moment. You're a practicing lawyer down in Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. And you thought to yourself what? Well, I was the director of labor relations at Universal Studios Hollywood. And I was in charge of negotiating nine different union contracts, deciding how much money people would make, how many vacation days they could take. And when they did something bad, I had to fire them. And so one night I said to my husband, I think I'm becoming a mean person. Wow. And he said, mm-hmm, yeah, you are. <laughs> and I was making a ton of money, and I love, love, love spending money. But I said to myself, what's the use of all this money if I'm not proud of who I am, if I'm not happy, if I don't think that I'm doing important work? And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, you know, I can't think of anything more important than working with kids. But I had been a substitute teacher. When I was working my way through Yale Law School, one of my jobs was being a substitute teacher. And being a teacher is the very hardest job I have ever had. What was hard about it? Oh, gosh. What was, what was, what was easy <laughs> about it <laughs> would be the question. What was easy about it what was leaving at the end of the day. Teachers are so underappreciated. They need to do so much. It's not just child care for the day. You have so many pressures um, coming at you, what you're supposed to teach, uh, what parents want you to teach. You have, you have 29 different personalities. It was, it's, an, it's a very, very difficult job. I think teachers are the most underappreciated people in, in the country. And so I wanted to do something with kids. I didn't yet have a child of my own. Now he's 21. But um, I thought, you know, what could I do? I don't know. One day I was walking through a bookstore. The next thing I knew, I was looking for a gift for my cousin who was two years old. Next thing I knew, I had an armload of books, picture books for two-year-olds that I wanted to buy for myself. And suddenly it hit me. Somebody wrote these books. Why couldn't I be one of those people? I didn't know anything about how to write a book or how to get it published, but I thought, you know, I can go to the library. I can figure it out. I can try. So that's, that's how it happened. And so that's how it began. Were you a vor voracious reader? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. Oh, interesting. That's very unusual. <laughs> no, for it, writers, that's very unusual. It is kind of unusual. I think for professional writers, it's kind of unusual. But when I work with kids, I find that very often some of the kids that we brand as um, struggling readers or reluctant readers are the ones who have the most to say. And they are very eager to write. You just have to point them in the in, in in the right direction and, and they'll take off. You know what I love about writing is, I had this thought the other day, is that there is no mundane topic. There is only a mundane perception of that topic. Right, right, right. right. If you can look into it yeah. and say, this is what's interesting about this. And yeah, right. That's well, all we care about. Or, you know, if someone had said, I want to write a picture book about a pigeon. Well, someone did say that, but before, <laughs> when he said, I want to write a, a picture book about a pigeon, I'm sure, I'm sure that, that, that nine out of 10 people he talked to said, a pigeon? Yeah. You know, how about a puppy, a kitten, a giraffe, an elephant, a pigeon? You know? So you have to look for, look for the, the excitement, make excitement out of the mundane. What is your writing process? How often, do you have a schedule when you write? Or do you let it just come when it comes? How do you how do you work? I have no schedule, no process. Is that how you always are in your life? <laughs> That's how I am in my oh, life. Okay. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, when an idea seizes me, I will go with it. Or best yet, if I am given an assignment, 
That's how oh. I really produce best if I'm given an assignment. So for instance, J. Patrick Lewis did uh, compiled a great anthology, 200 poems published by National Geographic. It's called the National Geographic Book of Animal Poetry. He contacted me probably, I want to guess maybe six months before his deadline and asked me if, uh, if I had some animal poems that I wanted to share with him. I sent him some and he said, great, I'll let you know if I use any of these, you know. Um, then about five and a half months later, he wrote me and said, I'm in a pinch. Can you write about, and he gave me three or four or five different animals. And he said, can you write about the poems about these animals uh, today? <laughs> That's, for me, a dream assignment because I write best under pressure. That's so funny. And so I said, okay, all right, I'll try to write a poem about a hummingbird. So I went and Googled hummingbird, picked some keywords to put in my word bank. You know, I tell kids to do that and I do that too. You want to start from somewhere. Maybe you have 20 words in your word bank and you might use one. But that's this is right. Word Bank is, is, is a sort of repository of words associated with that subject. Yeah, which okay. I usually write on the back of an envelope from whatever happens to be on my desk, right? So, so I did, did the, typed in hummingbird, wrote down a bunch of words, used a couple of things. Nectar, you know, came out. I, I wouldn't have thought of nectar myself, probably not. I would have thought in more general terms, hummingbirds drink from flowers. I wouldn't have thought nectar, but nectar came up, so I wrote down nectar. And then sometimes I'll use rhyme, even when I'm not intending to do a rhyming poem. Uh, it, even if I'm writing just a piece of prose, I'll use rhyme to brain, brainstorm more words for my word bank, for my informal word bank. So nectar came with inspector. And so the next thing I knew, I had this poem about a hummingbird who was a nectar inspector. and. Uh, <laughs> And it was so much fun. I never would have written that poem but for the assignment and the time constraint. Because if it was, oh, you know, write a poem about a hummingbird, you have two weeks, then maybe I actually would have gone and looked at a hummingbird, you know? But I had, I had one hour, so. Uh, That's so funny because sometimes the advice I give writers when they're saying, oh, I can't, oh, it's so procrastination, blah, blah, as I say, you're only allowed to write for 30 minutes. Right. It has to be over. Yeah. And suddenly that constraint makes it seem possible yeah. and unintimidating. Yeah, it's very freeing. Well, yeah. and, and then it gives us an excuse too, because then you've written this thing and you show it to your critique group person or you send it to whoever and you say, you know, I only had half an hour. <laughs> I only had half an hour, so what do you expect? But because you only had half an hour and you knew you w wouldn't be judged in monumental terms, all of a sudden it was very freeing. It's like, it's like I tell kids, you know, if somebody gave you a basketball there's the hoop, and they said, all right, I will um, give you a dollar for every free throw you make. Now, do you want to have five free throws and you have all day to make them? Or do you want to have one minute? To shoot as many. To shoot as many as you can, but you have only one minute, right? And, and most of us would say, let me shoot as many as I can in that one minute. I like that metaphor. Yeah? That's awesome. Yeah. So, so Nike really stumbled on something when they, <laughs> when they, when they came up with that just do it yeah. thing. I, I, I think about that probably once a day. You know, I come up against something that I don't really feel like doing, and I just I say, just do it. If only I could make myself do that with sit-ups, but I haven't been able to do that. <laughs> All right, Janet, I've got one more question for you. And what I'd like you to do is finish this sentence for me. If writing has taught me anything, it's taught me what? Hmm. Taught me to just try. To just try. And, and my guess is you are someone who is not an inhibited person in terms of your professional ambition before writing. But how did writing teach you that, further teach you that? Um, I think because with writing, you're, there's not so much cause and effect. Right. It's hard to see. It's, it's hard to say. You could write something that's outstanding and it doesn't get published. Or you could write something that you just slap on the paper and it does get published. So 
I think the randomness of the publication process has taught me to be less inhibited, to be less judgmental about myself, and to trust myself and just try, just try, you know? Um, an idea comes up, well, just try it and see. Just try it and see. Don't worry. Writing has taught me not to worry so much because uh, the world is so random. Just go with it.